so it's that time of the evening. I want to introduce myself and go over a few little things here. My name is Mark Beauchene, and I work for your New Hampshire Fishing Game Department. I want to welcome you to the 10th year of our Outdoor Adventure Series talks. Uh, these were put together as a way to say thank you to those who support the agency. Those hunters and anglers, snowmobile registrators, ATVers, etc. So what we decided to do is we were going to bring in some quality present presenters to educate our constituency to another level. Uh, through these programs, we've reached thousands. And uh, tonight, we've obviously filled the room. I want to thank you all for coming out um, on this chilly night. You came in past the restrooms. So if you need to get up, just get up and go. You don't need to raise your hand. Do your thing. Uh, take note of the exits. This this uh, agency has a history of fire. Take a picture in the back of the room. Those of you who are long-term concrete residents would remember what happened back in 1984. Um, if you have one of these, and I know you do, put it on stunt. <laughs> All right? We don't want to hear it. And, I don't, and our, our presenters don't either. This is out of respect. If you're going to take photographs, please be respectful to the other attendees. <clears throat> I'm also going to ask you to be respectful to the other attendees when it comes to asking questions. Try to not ask the same question twice, so we'll know if you're listening. So I've got a couple of couple of questions for you. So how is it that we can keep the lights on in here and bring you in? How does this agency make money? Any guesses? License fees. License fees. Anybody else? Donations. Yeah, some people don't make some money. How many here have a fishing license? Not even half the room. All right, let's do this again. How many people have a hunting license? The same people! <laughs> Can you believe that? You know what we call them? Ultra users. So, you all can say thank you to those folks. Your Fish and Wildlife Agency, your fishing game department, is self-funded. We're funded through their efforts of those who purchase hunting and fishing licenses. We also received some donations, but donations aren't going to keep the lights on. We also received some grant dollars through the federal aid system, but those are tied strictly to users. They're user pay, user benefits, such as boat ramps. If you've enjoyed a boat ramp that Fishing Game has built, thank an angler, because their fishing tackle purchases make that possible. Um, I'm going to leave this for you. For those of you who do not have a fishing license and you're looking for ways to support your fish and wildlife agency because they bring these wonderful things to you, and we're here to connect everybody to life outdoors, you don't have to go fishing to have a fishing license. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm okay? If everybody did that, I wouldn't have to ask. I would just say thank you, but I'm still going to say thank you. One more thing. If you had a seat, this was on your seat. This is your invitation to our big open house. Saturday, April 21st. It is free. It is super kid friendly. There's lots to do. Um, it's called Discover Wild New Hampshire Day. And it's a celebration of Earth Day, but it's more of a celebration of our conservation partners. As a small agency of 200 people, serving 200, 2 million plus, we can't do it alone. So we have conservation partners, such as New Hampshire Audubon. They're here to help us take care of the critters and spread the word of conservation and education for wildlife. With us tonight is Hillary Chapman. She's from the New Hampshire Audubon. She's going to give us a program on New Hampshire raptors. So, I guess to break in. But no, go right ahead. I don't have a license, but I have a hiking card, and everybody in this room should have one. See, I knew somebody would come up. <laughs> so there's uh, this thing called the Hike Safe card, uh, which is only available online. So you can find out the details about that. But um, thank you, sir. I want to move along from that and, and get to the business of the evening. Hillary, mm -hmm. they're all yours. All <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, thank you for coming, and I know we're all here because of this topic tonight is so engaging. And um, you join the ranks of um, Egyptian pharaohs and Roman warriors and medieval falconers and Native Americans of the uh, United States, all um, in celebration and our awe of raptors. And so um, I, uh, this quote, uh, for thousands of years, owls and hawks have captured our imaginations. And pardon me, I'm going to have to go back and forth. And why is that? What is it about raptors that draws us to them? Anybody want to share? What, what draws you to, um, to be here tonight, to learn more about raptors? What do you guys think? Why do you like raptors? Okay. <laughs> yes. Nice. So he says they're descendant from dinosaurs mm -hmm. and they're predators. Yes. I noticed that they hunt and they eat. They hunt <laughs> and they eat. Yes, definitely. Anything else? Okay. Yes. Uh, I like that uh, why they fly. Do you like how they fly? Yeah. And you know, and maybe that's what draws us because they are so visible to us where we see. What do you guys see coming back now? What anybody, um, I know, something that's really popping out to me is a particular raptor that's coming back north. Bald eagles. Bald eagles. Bald eagles. Yeah. Anything else? Turkey. Turkey, oh. Turkey vultures, yeah. yeah. Did you? Falcons. falcons, peregrine falcons, they're all coming back. So in New Hampshire, we have 14 species of hawks and 11 species of owls. Do they stay here all year long? No, nope. some of them do, some of them don't. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's exciting to watch them coming back and um, seeing them get active again. So um, before we get into that, into raptors, I do have to talk about um, uh, New Hampshire Audubon. And I'm wondering, are there any members of New Hampshire Audubon? A few? Awesome. So New Hampshire Audubon is dedicated to um, helping conserve New Hampshire's environment for not only wildlife, but for people. Um, and so we work very closely with uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game uh, because we have a, a shared mission. And um, we do it through a number of ways. Uh, we have sanctuaries. So if you've been to our McLean Center here in Cockert, that's one of our sanctuaries where we have trails. We encourage people to come and enjoy it, but leave everything as it is because it is a sanctuary for wildlife and the plants that, that grow there. Um, through conservation, you're probably very familiar with some of the conservation work we do. Is anybody here um, a citizen scientist helping count bald eagles? Does anybody help with that? We got one, great, thank you. Peregrine falcons, anybody help with that? We have some other um, projects going on, Project Nighthawk. Uh, how about Backyard Winter Bird Survey? Anybody help with that this year? So if you feed your backyard birds, that, uh, that's something that you can help us with because we really depend on citizen scientists, uh, the boots on the ground because we can't be everywhere. Um, we have education, of course, why I'm here tonight. And, um, and then we also have advocacy uh, where we're a voice for wildlife and helping um, uh, support conservation laws. So, all right, um, I have a number of, lots of information here about Audubon and things going on, so I'm happy to answer any questions when we're done. Okay, so raptors. Let me hear just a few of your favorite, what are some of your favorite raptors? The hawks? Okay, Cooper Hawk, yes. My favorite is a peregrine falcon. And a peregrine falcon, okay. <laughs> yes, owls, okay, right. So, so, but how do we know it's a raptor? How do we know these are raptors? Why, why isn't it a duck or a songbird? What do you think? Okay. Yep. Nice. So he says we know they are raptors because they have talons and they have um, a hooked beak for ripping and tearing their food. Very good. 
and the eyes towards the front of their head, so they have a better field of view. Very good. All right. So I have some of the mounts here of some of our more common um, birds, and these are two that will, you'll probably be seeing pretty soon, um, and some of you may have had them stay during the winter. Anybody know what these are? Any guesses? I know one's a cooper hawk. Okay, we've got the cooper hawk and the sharp shin. You can see why they're so um, easy to confuse, right? Um, and most of the time you just see them zip right by. These are our um, occipiters. They're smaller birds, they're birds of the forest. Um, they have small pointy toes, small talons, and they are particularly adapted for going after, anybody know what kind of prey they go after? Okay, actually it's a little different than that. Small birds, that's right, they're very adept at darting through the woods. Their wings are much, they have this sharp little point on their wings that allows them to maneuver around the, um, the trees. Um, and so how many people feed birds? Okay, you're probably helping them out a little bit. And that's okay, it's part of the natural process, right? And, and through, through the Christmas bird count, we know that some of these birds are staying longer because they have a food source. Um, that's the main reason birds migrate. It's not because it gets too cold, it's because they, um, they need to go where the food is. Okay, so then we move on up to our beautios, which is our, our bigger, larger birds like, um, well, I'm gonna have one in a second, I'll show you. Um, and anybody know what this is? Yes. A peregrine falcon, that's right. Um, and some of you are going, really? It's, but it's a juvenile, that's why it doesn't quite look um, like you normally see, what you probably see in most pictures. You can see those sideburns starting to form. Um, this is a bird, uh, is anybody familiar with the birds at the Bradley Sullivan Tower in Manchester? Yeah. Okay, guess how many eggs they have now? Anybody watching? Four. Four. She just laid her fourth egg. That means she's starting to incubate. So um, you can uh, go to our website, nhaudubon.org, and you can go right to um, the uh, single digits monitor of, of what, the, um, what they're doing. This bird, all those chicks are banded, and this bird, like teenage humans, when they're learning how to drive, what happens? Lots of accidents. And you can just imagine the uh, dangers that are in a city. So um, this bird was chasing, probably chasing a pigeon or something in the city and ran into a building and, and died. But we were able to um, have him or her for, um, for everybody to see, which, so, so she still is, uh, is helping us out, even though she didn't make it. But we've had the really good success with the chicks there. Um, every, uh, um, it's probably in June, end of May, the biologist goes in, Chris Martin, he'll go in, and he, um, we have a partnership with the building owners. They let us pull out the birds and, put, and ban them. So we can uh, keep track, kind of find out where they're going. Um, and by the way, peregrines are doing amazing. Um, their numbers are really increasing, um, and, uh, and we see, see it continuing to grow. All right. Who is this? Osprey. Osprey. Yes, a bird of what kind of habitat? Water, yes, our lakes. Um, and it is uniquely adapted. Um, its eyes, yes? I noticed that it grabs fish from the water. It does grab fish from the water. Now, is it easy to hold on to a fish? Have you ever tried to hold a fish? They squirm about, right? They're kind of slimy. So how does a raptor hold on to that fish? How does he do it? They have sharp claws to do it. They have sharp claws, and you know what else? They have a special foot. It feels like um, Velcro, feel that. So that helps them get a grip. And I'll have all this stuff afterwards, you can feel it. They also have the ability to take one of their toes and move it to the back to help hold on to that fish, which is pretty cool. All right. Yes? And I noticed um, that it can like, um, fly and like, go down and grab fish and then go back up. 
That's right. They fly down. They can see. They also have their special, they have built in, um, what are the sunglasses that allow you to see into water? Polarizer. Thank you. Polarized lenses. They have built in polarized lenses, right? So they can be way up in the sky, see, and see down through the water, through that reflection to see the, um, the fish. Yes? And then notice they dive like I saw one once, like I, on a daddy Sunday. Yep. And he, I saw one dive and grab a fish. It's very exciting to see them dive and grab fish. All right, so the peregrine falcon is still listed as threatened, okay? So it's still struggling, it's still getting support from, from the state protection, level of protection. How about, oh, thank you. How about this? What does this come from? Any guesses? Try again. Was any, another idea? What? Eagle. Eagle. This is from a bald eagle. And does anybody know uh, that the bald eagle was delisted? Uh, it's no longer considered endangered or threatened uh, federally or in our state, which is pretty astonishing. And the numbers are, are pretty amazing. In fact, Chris Martin, our biologist who's been tracking these for the past 30 years, um, thinks what we're getting close to maxing out at what our state can support, which is pretty amazing. So it's almost a common occurrence that I get stopped by people that say, I saw a bald eagle today. It's so neat, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and then um, we do have a new bird that's been added to, um, yes? Where do you mostly see the bald eagles? Like, is there, are they mostly uh, northern New Hampshire? Like, where would you normally see them? Across New Hampshire, where there's water, bo bodies of water. You can see them along the Connecticut River going up into Vermont. You can see them um, along the Merrimack. Um, they're uh, Newfound Lake. Um, they're, they're all over. I saw two of them in Winnipesaukee. Where? Winnipesaukee. Winnipesaukee. Yes. Um, the Hopkinton um, Dam area in Hopkinton has, has a nest. So. There's a family of bald eagles in Raymond. Oh, yeah. yeah. They used to live in Raymond. Okay. And all the time. Yeah. yeah, so it, they've become quite common, which is pretty astonishing considering we almost completely lost them back in the 70s. So, and it's because we recognize their decline was due to the pesticide DDT. And, and, um, and we were able to ban that pesticide and those numbers came back. There is a new pesticide that we're very concerned about. And I'm just, I'll put this out there. It's, called, there, it's a class of pesticide called neonicotinoids, or neonics for short. And um, if you are buying, getting ready to do gardening, um, and you see anything that says um, food for your plants or treats your lawn for bugs for three months or 12 months, it has neonic, neonics in it. And um, what that, it's a systemic pesticide that gets into the roots, the flowers, everything of a plant. So the hummingbirds, when they come and feed on the nectar, <coughs> they're taking in that pesticide. The bees, all the pollinators, you're probably hearing a lot about the pollinators crashing. They think it's all tied to the neonics, um, which washes into our water and into our vegetables and all of that. So avoid that if you can, um, I would avoid that. So let me go back to this. This is um, uh, newly on the list for New Hampshire as a, a threatened species. This is a northern harrier. And um, it's kind of not the best specimen, but there's something a little bit different about the look and of the face of this harrier. Does anybody see something that doesn't look quite hawkish, looks a little different? The small head. Small head, OK. The beak is different, okay. Anybody notice about how the fe arrangement of feathers? Yeah. The eyes seem a little bit like set into the head. Okay. How about the arrangement of feathers on the face? Does it remind you of another type of raptor? An owl. So this bird, instead of perching, like many of our hawks do, they'll perch and wait and look for their prey, this guy courses over meadows and wetlands. Um, it, listening, he uses these feathers, help funnel sounds into his ear, and he's listening as he's going over, looking for meadow voles and mice and things of that nature. Um, but 
Uh, New Hampshire, a lot of our open spaces have grown into forests, just natural succession. We have fewer open spaces, um, and so we don't, we don't have as much of the habitat that he needs. Okay. All right. So how about, you want to meet a bird? Okay, let's get a bird out. Okay. So um, this guy, uh, keep in mind, these are rehabilitated birds. He has an injury to his wing. And so um, he's, he's from the wild um, with an injury. So that compounds his stress level of being around people. So if we just keep our voices down when, we're, when, we have, when I have them out, that'd be great. So this is a Buteo. This is one of the other uh, groups of raptors that I mentioned before. He is um, a diurnal. That means active in the daytime. Anybody know which species he is? Yeah, I, I heard it. Yes. Red-tailed hawk. How many of you have seen a red-tailed hawk? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Woo. The most ubiquitous bird across the United States. You could go to New Mexico, California, um, and they're pretty much range wide in the United States. Um, and they're doing really well. They have they pretty much any open space. Where have you guys seen them? Everywhere. Everywhere. Typically, though, going down the highway, yeah. perched in trees. Okay. So I am going to play you something. Have you ever heard this in a movie? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hear that? <laughs> so that's a pretty popular call used in movies, even if you're in the rainforest. Or, you know, Antarctica, now you know when you hear that, you're going, wait a minute. There's, there are no red tails in the tropical rainforest, by the way, or Antarctica. Um, so the red tail, this guy, any guesses on how much he weighs? Two pounds. Five pounds. Five pounds. Close. Two pounds. Weighs right about two pounds. Okay. And, this other guy, I'm going to go stand back here. He's. <laughs> there. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, he weighs about two pounds. And what does he eat? Any guesses on what he eats? Mice. Mice. 80% of his diet is mice. He. Yeah, I need to bring my, uh, my fancy poop catcher here. Okay, so 80% of his diet is mice. They're pretty important in the environment for catching and keeping um, uh, small rodents in check. And so you've seen them perching in the trees. How do they find that little bitty mouse down in the grass? How do they do it? X-ray vision. X-ray vision, just about. Their eyes. It's, they have amazing eyes. Um, their eyesight is eight times better than ours. So how, do they, how many of you like to go see uh, Fisher Cats baseball? Sometimes you can't go to good seat. If you had hawk eyes, you could buy the cheapest seat in the house, sit all the way in the back, and you'd be able to see the expression on the players' faces. Um, so they have really great eyesight. But now you're thinking about, okay, there's all this grass, and you know those animals are scurrying under. They're trying to stay hidden. So how do they see through the grass? X-ray vision. X-ray vision. <laughs> okay, so close. So um, ra raptors uh, have some special oils in their eye. Remember how I mentioned how they have built in... Um, yeah, polarized lenses. Why that word doesn't come to me? Polarized lenses. Well, they have these oils that um, enhance certain colors. So can you guess which colors are enhanced in their, in their eyes? 
Browns. Browns. White. White. Yellows. Gray. And guess which colors are muted? Black, green. Green, right. The other thing is they can see a level of light we can't see. And so that means they can actually see the urine trails that these little animals leave, which is pretty astonishing. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. So does anybody have a question? Can we pet? Pardon? Can we pet it? No, no petting. Yeah. He would he doesn't, I mean he he likes I can be this close to him because you guys are out there and he knows me better than he knows you. But that's about it. So um, his talons are very sharp. You can see I have this glove on. A couple times, he's mis when he's been very hungry in the wintertime, he's mistaken my hand and grabbed my hand. And um, when he puts that pressure on, those talons can sink right into my skin like a knife going into butter. It's pretty amazing. But as soon as he realizes I'm not food, he pulls it right out. So he, he's a good guy. I've never felt... Um, uh, worried about being around him or anything. And he is, if you can see the little fluffy feathers here, I had some that I brought with me. Right now they're starting to molt. And what are the fluffy feathers that are coming out now? Down. Yes? Uh, down, and I've actually seen a red-tailed hawk. I live right next to the Wenatosaki. In my neighbor's front yard, it had caught a duck. Oh. Wow. Nice. Wow. Yeah, you don't often get to see that. That's, that's pretty neat. So, um, so if you come over to the Concord Center, this is one of the birds that you can see, uh, you'll start seeing that he's losing. I heard downy, right? Is that what I heard? The little fluffy feathers. If you have down comforters, down pillows, um, those are those fluffy under feathers, like their long johns that they get for the winter. They get lots more. Birds that stay up here for the winter put on, grow lots more downy feathers to help them survive and give them that insulation like their built-in winter jacket. And so about this time of year, they're starting to molt. And you'll come by and you'll see them. They're stuck to the netting in front of the, um, the mew. Um, and they're really, like I was playing with some today. If you come by and there's some in the mew, you can just pull them out. But they, um, it's almost if you've ever touched spider webs, and spider webs are real sticky. They're kind of, it, they're really interesting, um, fascinating um, engineering for those. Other questions? Yes? How far along is he in his rehabilitation? So he is done, and so he went, so he, first our birds, they go to a veterinarian, um, and our veterinarian that works with our birds is Dr. Dutton from the Ware Animal Hospital, who's outstanding and been taking care of all our animals for many years. Um, <clears throat> And then they go to Maria Colby, uh, Wings of Dawn and Henniker, which you may be familiar with. Um, and then when they're, they're healed, after they've been with her, he's essentially healed. His problem is um, this uh, right wing. It, when it healed, it didn't heal well enough for um, him to be able to have sustained flight. So even if we have him flying in his mew or something, he starts to tire out. Um, and so that's why he stays with us. But as you can see, he still has both wings. Some of our birds don't have their both wings. Um, he has a swing in his mew. He loves his swing. You can come see him on a swing. <laughs> really enjoys that. Um, so he eats mice. What else is he going after? What did I hear? Chipmunks. Chipmunk. So I have a great story. One day, we always feed them dead mice. One day I came in and to his, um, his mew and he was mantling like this. So this is, that's when a bird covers, prote is protecting something. I had all this food, I'm peeking around going, what does he have? Guess what he had? A chipmunk. And if you come over and see the small um, uh, fencing that we have, I don't know how it got in, but this guy was pretty happy he still had it. <laughs> He's been with us for 13 years. When he came, he did not have a red tail. Um, he, it was still, um, a, uh, juveniles don't get their red tail until two or three years old. So um, he came to us in 2003. So we're guessing he's 13, 14 years old. Um, so, and he just caught this chipmunk like two years ago. 
So he's still a pretty good, a pretty good hunter. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes, you're okay. What is their lifespan? So in captivity, he could live uh, 25, 29 years. Any guesses how long they live in the wild? Yeah. Less than that. Maybe 10. And, um, and you can imagine why they live longer with us. They get regular meals. They get a fast day on Sunday. Um, they get to see the doctor, just like we go for annual physical. Do you see the doctor every year and he takes your weight, looks at your eyes? Same thing. Dr. Dutton comes to see our guys. And guess what else they get? Do you take vitamins? You have Fred Flintstone vitamins? Yeah. So they get vitamins. Every Wednesday is their vitamin day. So um, they're, they're well taken care of. Right. Does he have to worry about any predators? Yes, um, especially when they're young. So uh, the most fierce predator we have in this state, can anybody guess? Which one? Great horned owl. Eats just about anything. And it, 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 the, the, the great horned owl, I think, is three to five pounds, three to four pounds. But it can carry the, the pound. Um, Per square inch that it can carry is I've, I've up to like 4,000 PSI. They have an incredible, they can carry porcupines, a skunks, uh, raccoons, it, pretty amazing. We had a puppy uh, a year, two years ago, and I, my husband would want to put it out in the yard when it's getting dark. I'm like, no, that, that dog's coming in. So yeah, it's a good reason not to let your animals roam free, especially cats. Okay. All right, so what I might do, yes? What is the body temperature of a bird like that? Body temperature, um, about 108 degrees, I believe. Uh, somewhere around there. Yeah, I think so. I might, I'd have to double check that. Yeah. You know, we're not sure, but in most cases, um, if you think about where you see red-tailed hawks, which is mostly around roads and they're swooping after um, small mammals yep and so they get hit a lot um, and, and I always say you know maybe this doesn't have a huge impact but every little bit helps is always don't throw trash out your windows um, you know mice are going to be along the road anyway but it just it attracts them even more if there's trash out on the sides of the roads it's going to attract the predators to come in okay so I was going to go over our owls in New Hampshire, but I think I'm going to bring this guy out. He's ready. Okay, I heard somebody say what kind it is. Barn. B barn. It's yeah. B A R N. Why is it called the barn owl? It's where they live. It's where they live, right? So um, they like abandoned barns, any abandoned buildings um, they're going to use. Um, so we have this bird, but it's only a rare visitor in New Hampshire. Um, the only recorded um, nest of a barn owl was in Hollis in 1977. But if you go over the border into Massachusetts, their frequency increases and it, you can just, there's more and more the further south you go. So they prefer, they prefer warmer climates. Um, and they're not as well, so if you take a look at this owl foot, this owl foot, and, and the, his, app, his feet, what's the big difference? Yeah. Right. He doesn't have a lot of feathers on his feet. So that's one, you know, so there's one thing that doesn't, it's not as helpful. Uh, the owls that stay here year round have feathered um, feet all the way down to their toes. Um, has anybody been to the, our Audubon Center to see him? 
You have? Okay. So we, you have too. So he just went on display um, our Peregrine Falcon. How many have been over to see our Peregrine Falcon? So she's um, a little sick and in recovery. So she is not on dis um, display right now so that she's less stressed by having um, people come by. And so now he's in her mew. So you can come by and see him any, every, any time. Um, typically, barn owls are truly nocturnal um, owls. And so he's just going to be snoozing somewhere in the mew. Not a, not a whole lot going on unless we come in to feed. Um, and so he just had a birthday. You can see... Do you, do you see the difference in this bird versus the red tail? Does he look a little more comfortable? Yeah. So he's um, imprinted on people. So he came to us from the um, Alwyn, in Alwindal, South Carolina, the um, Center for Bird Conservation. And so one of the reasons he lives with us is because he's imprinted on people and can't um, fend for himself in the wild. The nice thing about this, it takes the stress off the birds that are, um, have, been, uh, have injuries and are wild. Um, and so he, he comes out and does lots of programs with us just because it's less stressful. So what makes him an owl? How, what makes him an owl? Let's see, yeah. His face. His face. Yeah, that awesome round face. So in those forward-facing eyes, what are some of the, um, the words you've heard to describe owls? What did I hear? Wise. wise. Wise old owls. Wise owls. And, you know, I often think, why do we think they look so wise? Any thoughts? I think it's because of those forward-facing, um, their, uh, their face looks very much like our face. And it all has to do with their survival. They have a greater field of view by having those forward-facing eyes. Now, why is their face round? So the, the neat thing that you know about animals is they don't look the way they do just because it's pretty and cute. There is a definite reason. So why are their faces, their feathers in that shape? They can get sound easier. They collect sounds towards their ear. Exactly. So if you think of their face is like this fleshy part of our ear. And you can even, um, the owls can change the feathers, the direction of the feathers on their face to help direct the sound in, which is pretty amazing. So if you put your, your um, cupped your ears, and if you cupped them and moved that around, you could hear how the sound changes just by what I'm saying. Same thing with the owls. They take the sound, they move those feathers. Pretty amazing. So... Where are they moving the sound to? Where are their ears? Where are their ears? Right in the front of their head. They are right behind their eyes, buried in those feathers. Um, and it's described that they have 3D hearing. If you can imagine 3D hearing, and what I like to say, if you've ever played a, a game with, um, you know, your... Uh, in a jet like a Star Wars game or you think about a Star Wars movie and they're trying to zero in on the guy, the bad guy they're going to shoot and you see it going all around like this. That's how their hearing is because their ears are asymmetrical. Our ears are symmetrical, same place. Believe it or not, if they had fleshy parts like we do, imagine one ear would be up here and one ear would be down here. And that gives them the ability, not only, like, we can hear, oh, what's something on the left and the right. They hear left and right and above and low. And if you watch, has he done any of this with his head? Yeah. Okay, that's, he's zeroing in on sound. You think about that fighter pilot, right, with that joystick trying to zero in on his, um, his target. So um, scientists always ask questions, and, of course, the question with owls is, okay, they have good hearing, but how good is it? So they put a barn owl in a room that was completely pitch black, no light, and they released a mouse. How fast did it take him to find it? How fast? 15 seconds. 15 seconds. I got 15 seconds. Oh. I'm not doing very good with my, uh, 
oh man, where's Mark? He's going <laughs> to, we'll just cover it up. <laughs> okay. All right, I've got two seconds, 15 seconds. What else? How fast do they find? Yes. One minute. A thirtieth of a second. Okay. A thirty of a second. That, I think that's even faster than us blinking. So it's, they're, they're, um, their hearing is amazing. The other thing, if they're praying at night, they have to be able to see well, hear well. And what about being stealthy? They've got to be silent flyers. Okay. So when you come up in a little bit, you can take a look at... So I have uh, feathers that our birds have molted. So here's an eagle feather, okay? And if everybody just listens for a second. You hear that? And you probably hear when birds fly over you, you can hear their, their wings. I don't think... Okay, so now I'm going to do it with the owl feather, okay? You can hear it a little... I, I don't think this is my owl feather. <laughs> I can't, you can see me looking at it, but I don't think that's it. It's not quite the same thing. Anyway, all right. So when you come up and look, you'll see the edges of diurnal birds, birds that are active in the day that rely on their sight and not on being quiet, um, have um, a solid edge. Birds that need to be quiet and hunt at night have a comb-like edge. So if you think about when you comb your hair, right, and your hair goes through your fingers, that think of the air going through the edge of their feathers. And when you come up, you can look and see that comb-like edge on there. So that really helps them. Okay. So, so much to talk about with owls. I love owls. Yes. Can they turn their heads all the way around? So if they could, what would happen to the blood flow to their brain? What would happen? It would cut it off. That's right. That's they right. They can only turn their head all the way to the back. They, so they, do you want to come up here for a second? Okay. All right, so stand on this side. Okay. So, okay, so look over your shoulder. All right, so we can about look over our shoulder, not quite 180 degrees, okay? All right, now turn around. Okay, and everybody reach around. If you've got a kid, reach around, touch his shoulder blade. If you were an owl, or any raptor actually, you could look over your shoulder blades. So that would be like looking back right over here. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, so how can they do that? We can't do it. How can they do it? What do you think? What allow? What gives them that flexibility? Their spine. Good. Are you feeding her answers? Wow. Uh, it's the books you're reading. Some books. Okay. So actually has to do with their um, their neck, the number of bones in their neck. So okay, I know you're not in school, but you can tell your your math teachers that you did some math homework tonight. We have seven vertebrae in our neck. Owls, raptors, have twice as many. How many do they have? Fourteen. That gives them the flexibility. Just like a snake. A snake has, you know, 100 to 400 vertebrae, which allows them to move in those curves, those S's. All right. So um, what other questions do you have? Yes. Yes. Okay, so he was hatched in captivity um, down at the Center for Avian Conservation. Yeah, so he came to us. In fact, he just had his first birthday um, a week ago. Yes, if you want to buy him a birthday present, you can go online and buy him a mouse. Go to our website. Um, so yeah, he didn't get a cake. He just got an extra mouse for his birthday, and he was happy with that. Um, a uh, mouse cake. I should have made him a mouse cake, definitely. So uh, it's interesting how, how much we revere raptors. But uh, one time I had a second language learner science class come to the center. 
And um, they came from all different parts of the world, um, a number of a uh, African countries, um, Philippines, and they have a very different take on raptors, which is really fascinating. That they're, um, uh, you know, and you've probably read this in fables and myths, that they can um, be harbingers of death or disease or things like that. So I had kids when I, I brought these out that are actually fearful of them. So it was really interesting. Um, so we've talked about their important role in helping control um, uh, pest animals like mice. Uh, we've talked about how their um, environmental barometers telling us about the dangers of something like DDT and now these neonicotinoids. Um, but there's also other things that these birds are doing for us. Whoops, I'll go the other way. I just want to. Um, so anybody, what's going on in this picture? Carcass. Yes. Uh, what? Whose eyes? Yeah. Anybody know what kind of owl it is? Great horned owl. Now, does it really have horns? No. 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 Yeah, we call those feather tufts. Um, and we think we're not sure they help with. Okay. They help with uh, communication, maybe. Like they can raise them and lower them, like your cat and dog raise and lower their fur when they're not happy. Um, <laughs> And they might also help with camouflage. So what's going on in this picture is our, our um, biologist was taking part in a golden eagle survey across the country trying to get an idea of uh, where the golden eagles are, their ranges. And so he got permission from landowners and he put deer carcasses out in different places around New Hampshire. Um, and they put uh, cameras on them. We got some really cool pictures like uh, bobcats coming in, uh, coyotes fighting with a bobcat. It was very interesting. So, um, but what I want to talk about in this picture is um, how raptors also are helpful in cleaning um, our environment of um, diseased, dead carcasses. Um, even our bald eagle. I had a call recently from a concerned um, community member who thought it was bad that we were feeding, um, not good that we were feeding the eagle, our eagle rats. And so eagles have a very diverse diet, not just fish. So our eagle gets quail, which is a small bird, um, rats, and fish, lots of fish. And you can see in the wild, they'll even go after carrion. You know, when you need to eat, you're going to eat what's out there. Even the sweet little chickadees in the wintertime will feed off of um, de decomposing animals. So, and this is our typical vulture of what you think is going after uh, carcasses. So here's a nice picture of a red tail with a meadow vole. Um, oh, this is talking about, I, you know, back in the 70s, you did not see these birds. You did not see, if you went to Florida, you did not see brown pelicans. It was the DDT that had done that. And thank goodness we figured that out. And now, well, thank goodness, we can see these birds easily now. You don't have to go that far out of your way. So, what does the peregrine falcon have to do with this F-16 fighter jet? The peregrine How fast can a peregrine falcon dive? 200 miles an hour, which is astonishing. And so, scientists and engineers were thinking, how can this bird physically do that? And can we learn something on how this bird does it that can help our fighter pilots so that they don't pass out when they're going for these dives? And so they've been able to study the peregrine and improve the safety of our fighter jets. What does an American kestrel have to do with this drone, which is incidentally named a kestrel? What do you think? It can hover. It can hover. Good. And who hovered, who came up with hovering first? The kestrel. So scientists, they studied the American kestrel. They were trying to figure out how can we watch the bird and the, the, the way that it moves its feathers to hover um, and apply that to our drone technology. So they, that studying of this, of this raptor has helped drone technology. Uh, superheroes are kind of like 
so ubiquitous in our society now. And when did they start? Maybe early 1900s with comic books, the first comic books? I'm not even sure. Um, but how many, can you, how many superheroes can you guys think of that are ins inspired by raptors? One. Which one? <laughs> the falcon. The falcon. Well, apparently, I didn't know this. There's a red hawk. There's a dark hawk. Um, there's also uh, birds of prey, a whole series of um, birds of prey superheroes. Oh, this is pretty interesting. So you may have read about the impact that birds have on planes. There's a lot of collisions with planes. And um, so one of our biologists is uh, looking at, remember how I mentioned that birds can see a level of light we can't see? So they're looking at shortwave LED uh, lights as a way to um, uh, try to keep the birds from coming into buildings, wind turbines, planes. And what they've done is use red-tailed hawks as their guinea pig because there's so many around, right? They're easy to, to work with. And even in the day, so it, we can't see it. In the daytime when they've used it, um, at dusk and dawn at night, we just see a little bit of it but it has um, actually helped um, detract the birds from coming towards uh, whatever they're trying to keep them away from. Mm -hmm. So again, we, you, know, you think about how much we look to nature to help us and um, be better at, what, uh, at living, how we the live. The owl pooped again. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> at work, when I walk around with him, I, I have a little dish. I actually, I've gotten pretty good at catching it. Um, <laughs> I should have brought that tonight. <laughs> I'm keeping him out because he seems a little bit happier here than yeah. in there. So, um, oh, and then music. Uh, John Denver, uh, for John Denver fans, has a, a Hawk and Eagle song. Christina Aguilera has a Birds of Prey song. Bob Dylan, so much was um, in, in just in art. So um, I will end with, because I think I've been talking for a very long time, <laughs> Um, this is a Gary Larson, for anybody who remembers Gary Larson, uh, iconic uh, animal uh, cartoonist. Uh, it says, birds of prey know they're cool. <laughs> what more can you say, right? <laughs> they're just cool. So um, I will be up here with, um, to answer any questions about this stuff. Uh, feel free to take any of the stuff over there. Um, oh, I do have, I do have, um, this is a mammal bone and then a bird bone, if you want to compare the difference in, um, in the weight, what, one of the uh, adaptations for flight, um, and the bones of uh, a wing. So take a look at that. Okay? All right. Um, and come visit us at McLean Center. Um, this summer, I will be offering um, feeding times. You can come watch the feed. Um, our, our bald eagle loves um, water. And so we give him showers daily in the summer. And he does, you can come um, check out the Bald Eagle Rain Dance. <laughs> and you can amuse your friends and colleagues at work with doing the Bald Eagle Rain Dance. Um, so look for that coming, and we'll be doing some more programs this summer. Oh, and summer camp for kids that like nature. And next weekend is our Earth Day uh, Fair down at our, our wonderful, beautiful Massabesic Center. All right.